Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here today with our congressional delegation to announce an unprecedented investment in Vermont's Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, also known as LIHEAP. As a result of changes in legislation, this year, Vermont will receive an additional $28.3 million on top of the $20.7 million we normally see in our block grant for a total of $49 million for LIHEAP. This increase is due to Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch, who work incredibly hard to protect our most vulnerable each and every day. We're grateful for their efforts, and I want to thank them directly for all they do to help us back home in Vermont. The Department for Children and Families administers the LIHEAP program, which helps low-income households with heating costs, weatherization, energy efficiency, and any crisis involving energy in their homes. With this increase in funding, we'll make sure eligible families have a warm home this winter. These additional dollars will allow us to do a number of things to help the vulnerable. For example, we'll be able to increase fuel benefits, provide more money for weatherization services, including furnace repair and replacement, which could help about 260 more households. We'll increase the number of gallons or cords of wood you can receive under the crisis fuel program. Provide a one-time check of $400 to those who qualify to offset the cost of electric heat, benefiting 18,000 households. And a one-time check for $120 to renters whose heating costs are included in their rent, which will benefit 2,250 households. We also shift the wood benefit from fall to spring to give families who heat with wood the opportunity to buy when costs are lower so they get more for their money. These federal LIHEAP funds are included in the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, and it's coming at a good time as we head into winter because we don't want to leave anyone behind. Individuals and families can apply through the DCF <coughs> website or through a paper application available by mail or in person at any DCF district office. People can also get assistance by applying at any of our community action agencies or at your local agency on aging. Our goal here today is to make sure that if you're a Vermonter eligible for these funds, you know how to get them. We're joined today by DCF Deputy Commissioner Tricia Tayo and Nicole Tuziat Yant for the LIHEAP program, and by Tom Donahue, the Executive Director of Brock representing all of our community action agencies. We rely on our dedicated state staff and our partnerships with the community providers like Community Action to reach Vermonters, to get the work done, to make sure that no eligible Vermonter goes without heat. And now I'd like to turn this over to my good friend, Senator Leahy, to say a few words. Senator. Governor, thank you very much. And, uh, it's good to be here with you and with my friends Bernie Sanders and Peter Welch and the others. I think all of us as Vermonters know how quickly cold weather comes to Vermont. I remember flying back one day to Washington and people were complaining how cold it was. It was 25 degrees. And I said, well, it was 25 degrees at my house when I left Middlesex this morning. And they said, well, that's not very cold. I said, 25 degrees below zero, which is not unusual. You know, we're going to be taking, very soon, Vermont taking wood off the wood piles, adjusting thermostats, turning up the heat, and not just for comfort, but for many, it's going to be uh, absolutely vital for the health. It's 40 years ago when we established the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. I remember how proud I was when I, first, when I first voted for that, never realizing how important it would, would become. And as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, I've supported increases to the program's funding. I've worked to increase its funding by uh, 
110 million, direct more than 5 billion in supplemental funding to the COVID program. But those are just numbers. Uh, the reality is what the people who run it and do it, they're the ones who get the money out. Last year, 39,000 Vermont households were able to receive a combined 19 million in heating assistance. And now, as the governor said, with the money, even more are going to be able to be helped. Whether it's, and here's another way they'll be helped. Not just keep your home warm, but replace old fuel tanks, weatherize your homes, so it'll take less to keep it warm. Community actions agencies like Capstone here in Central Vermont can walk people through that application program. Nobody should have to choose between heating their home, putting food on the table, or getting the modifications they need. We know there's increasing fuel prices, but well, LIHEAP can help. And Vermont homes are some of the oldest in the country. Many were built long before modern energy efficiency techniques. I was thinking of that as we drove by the house I grew up in across the street. That was built in the 1800s. You have to make them more energy efficient. And I'm grateful for the work of Efficiency Vermont, the Community Action Agencies, the State of Vermont, NeighborWorks <coughs> Heat Squad. Uh, these are important. So we're working on other things in Washington, as you know. Uh, Senator Sanders has been directing so hard the uh, Build Back Better plan. We have programs like LIHEAP, Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program that Peter and Bernie and I have always uh, worked on. The Infrastructure Investments Act that's passed the Senate uh, this summer included a historic $3.5 billion for LIHEAP. So, the money will be there, but I'll just, before I go, I'll just leave one, one thing for Vermonters. Mm -hmm. I request one thing of Vermonters. If you need help, please apply. Don't think the help may or may not be there. It will be there, so apply. And don't be too proud to accept some assistance. After all, it's Vermonters taking care of Vermonters. We can do it. We know what a winter is like. We know the heating it can be done. So if you need the help, apply for it. And with that, I'll turn to the man who has all his hand on the budget, my good friend, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> all yours, Bernie. Okay. Uh, let me thank uh, Governor Scott for organizing this and for the announcements he has made today. Uh, thank Senator Leahy, the chairman of the appropriations, and Congressman Peter, Peter Welch for the great work uh, that they are doing for Vermont and the nation. Uh, sometimes we forget, but we shouldn't. We are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Uh, in, in a wealthy nation, there should not be folks who are struggling to stay warm uh, in the wintertime. And in our state, a very significant percentage of the people uh, who receive LIHE benefits are elderly, uh, people living on fixed incomes, uh, people who have severe disabilities, uh, young families with children. And we have a moral responsibility to make sure that nobody in the state of Vermont uh, goes cold in the wintertime, and that is, in fact, uh, what we have done. Uh, I'm very proud that, with the help of Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch, in the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, we added an additional $4.5 billion to LIHEAP uh, bringing the total funding amount to $8.25 billion. In other words, we increased life funding by over 50 percent. And that means, as the governor just indicated, we now have the opportunity in the state to make sure that far more people receive the benefits that they need and they receive the generous benefits uh, that they are entitled to. Uh, it seems to me, if I could pivot just a bit, that we are in a pivotal moment in American history, and there's a great debate uh, going on in Washington right now. And that is whether or not we have a government in our democratic society 
which represents all of the people, including the most vulnerable people, and that is the elderly, people with disabilities, the children, or we have a government which represents the wealthy and the powerful. And as we speak right now, you have special interests spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that we do not do what needs to be done for working families and for lower income people. But I'm very proud of the fact that we have substantially increased LIHEAP funding. I'm proud of the work that uh, the uh, government here in Vermont and, and many of the CAP agencies are doing to get that money out. And I urge everybody who's entitled to these programs uh, to take advantage of them. Thank you. And now let me introduce the one and the only, the best representative that Vermont has in the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> By, uh, What's your name, Peter Walsh? <laughs> um, Bernie, that is high praise. The best one in Vermont. I really appreciate that. And we've got the two best senators, not go. only in Vermont, but in the nation. And Governor Scott, you are doing a great job. We really appreciate you being here uh, and inviting us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been said about LIHEAP, but I want to just make a couple of points. Uh, Nobody who is in a economically precarious position has any control over the cost of home heating oil. But they all need to turn up the thermostat when it gets cold. And energy prices are going up, which makes the urgency of the distribution of LIHEAP funds uh, all the more important. We can't let folks who don't have any control over energy prices and who don't have any control over how cold it gets, those folks have got to stay warm. And them staying warm can't come at the expense of them not being able to get the medication they need or the food they need. And all three of us here and the governor have been long time strong supporters of the low income heating assistance program. And we've been able to get a lot of support in Congress for that by working at it every year, but also by recognizing that it includes providing assistance to folks who are ever uh, subjected to high heat, because in the western states, uh, it allows for some cooling, which is the threat to people on low incomes. So there's an acknowledgment here that this challenge we face is getting even more severe with the severe weather and the extreme heat that we're seeing, as well as the consistent winters of cold weather where our folks really absolutely depend on access to funds through the LIHE program. The second point I want to make is that the only way this is effective is when we have an infrastructure within the state and within our community action agencies that is getting out the word to people about the availability of this, and then doing the hard work of implementation, getting people to sign up, making it easy for them to do it, but also through the, 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 the programs about energy efficiency and tightening up the homes. So this has been a long-standing commitment that's had long-standing bipartisan support through Republican and Democratic governors and through the congressional delegation. The third point I want to make sort of bears a little bit on what Bernie was talking about. This legislation that is before Congress now, uh, the Build Back Better plan, has a very significant component to finally start addressing climate change. And yes, we're always going to have to help folks with their energy bill, but we have to start addressing the big challenges about climate, and that includes making our buildings more efficient, our homes more efficient. And among other things, in the Build Back Better program, there is money for energy efficiency that creates incentives for people to be able to afford to make their homes tighter. And that would include uh, folks who own homes and shelters as well. Because the bottom line here is we have got to have a response which LIHEAP is to the immediate urgency of paying the fuel bill so you keep warm, 
but we have to, it's long overdue, to have a response to the severe weather incidents that are getting even more extreme, which is one of the reasons why I so, so strongly support uh, the Build Back Better bill with its first and only low and long overdue uh, emphasis on climate issues. Thank you. At this point, we'll open up to questions. Yeah, tough questions. Yeah, and I'll pass them off on to them. <laughs> Is there a maximum amount that, uh, that a recipient can get under this program? You talked about the higher fuel prices, maybe 50% higher than, than last year at this time. So uh, is this money going to go as far? Yeah, I mean, the, the prices are, petroleum prices are increasing, um, but, uh, but with this additional money uh, comes uh, more opportunity. I don't know if Tom or, or any one of the I three of you. say that uh, Come on up. The, the Tom Donahue of the Brock Community Action and um, I want to say that the additional funds will go farther. Um, there is never enough, as we always say, there's never enough money at the end of the month. So it's always difficult to serve the Vermonters, even with the amazing work that these gentlemen have done to fund the LIHEAP program over the years. But there is always so much more to do that um, the additional funds will go a long way to addressing that. But regardless of the pricing going up or not, it won't ever be quite enough, but it'll start to make uh, uh, the progress we need in the direction of energy savings and assisting those in crisis on a regular basis. I have a saying that uh, the foundation of a great community is only as strong as how we treat our most vulnerable. And I know the governor's had as part of a tenant of his platform, and these gentlemen, of course, it's part of the way they operate in their lives to make sure that vulnerable Vermonters are, uh, that we watch out for them in Vermont. The Farmer's Almanac says it's going to be a really long, cold winter. So, you know, there are people in need. Um, the pricing will definitely maybe reduce how far it stretches, but the amount of funds will go so much farther that um, I'm actually not concerned about that as a, as an, as a factor. Um, it's really the most important thing, as the governor indicated, is getting the word out to make sure that we're reaching the Vermonters. And as the senator said, to make sure that people don't hesitate to apply because the funding is there to assist and we at the community action level, we're the boots on the ground, we're, we're ready to assist, but we do have to make that connection to Vermonters in need and we don't want them to hesitate to reach out to us if they are in need uh, because these funds are so critical, these are vital funds. And I, I just wanna thank you all and applaud you for providing this additional assistance to, to the folks that are you know, going to be in need this long winter as we and might anticipate. And what, and what Tom says, we all agree, you know, there's not a, an inch between any one of us politically or anything else of this, but it emphasized one thing, to the extent that you have the ability to upgrade uh, an insulation, do the things that are necessary to make your homes more uh, uh, heat efficient, right. take advantage of that, take advantage of I just want to say I'm in, at the base of the ski industry at Rutland, which is called Killington, as you know. A long winter is not always a bad thing if you're in the ski industry. But anyway. Tom, good to see you. Anything we're missing that you want to add? Okay, thank you. Governor, I did want to mention, though, that um, the whole situation that we're dealing with, with, fund, with uh, assistance, assistance for people in need, is exacerbated by the pandemic. And because of our unfortunate uh, Delta variant, which is making this pandemic languish. I just want to be clear that, you know, that there are more Vermonters in need now than ever, and that, you know, we don't have, um, we haven't seen the end of it yet, and there are new Vermonters in need, many who have lost employment over time, maybe their businesses have closed, they've been furloughed, and it's not just folks of low income that might have been uh, the typical folks that we're serving, but we're seeing a lot of new Vermonters in need of these funds. So the timing for the addition couldn't come at a more important time uh, for Vermont. Mr. Donahue, what organization are you with again? So it's Brock Community Action. Thank you. 
But I think, I believe you're representing all the community oh, action. Yes, and um, so we. Thank you. That's I have, exactly uh, what we I have think. a partnership, the Vermont Community Action Partnership, where five community action organizations, very efficient and effective, somewhat nimble, being only five of us, we cover the entire state. And we're really the implementers for many of these state programs. So when these great uh, individuals pass legislation that create the funding and the programs, we're the boots on the ground that gets it to the Vermonters. And uh, you know, the funding for fuel, for instance, Governor, one of the great things about that is the funding doesn't go to the individual, it goes to the fuel dealer, it goes to the business that delivers the fuel or delivers the wood or delivers the pellets. So it's all almost as an economic engine of its own in addition to support local business. Governor, what happens <clears throat> um, if there's money left over at the end of the year in some of these programs? I mean, we're, we're basically doubling it, essentially. What happens if there is leftover money? Uh, well, again, I think that's a, that's a federal question. I'm not sure whether it gets uh, clawed back or stays in the program. Does anyone, maybe we have the answer right here. We're allowed to carry forward 10% of the funds and anything else that is left over would be returned next October. Um, but we do have some flexibilities in the spring to do things like the spring fuel, uh, the spring wood benefit, which will help keep those funds in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> Any other questions? Typically, we're here for like two hours. So I don't <laughs> Can we try a different topic? Um, Depends what the topic is, sure. <laughs> well, I, I just had a question for Senator Sanders. He mentioned this being a pivotal time in our U.S. history, and we all know you're working on the infrastructure bill, the social bill. Uh, I'm wondering how confident you are that when all is said and done, <clears throat> that you're going to have a bill that addresses the needs that you set out in the beginning. Well, uh, Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch are working hard on these bills as well. Um, what has been very interesting to me in this process is poll after poll shows overwhelming support for what we are trying to do. The American people understand that the wealthy and large corporations, who in many instances are not paying their fair share of taxes, should pay their fair share of taxes. Overwhelmingly popular. That's what people believe in fairness. The American people understand that there's something pretty crazy when we pay, in some cases, 10 times more for prescription drugs than our neighbors in Canada or in Europe. The American people, by huge numbers, want us to take on the pharmaceutical industry and lower the cost of prescription drugs in America. Poll after poll shows that the American people believe that it is absurd that we have elderly people in Vermont and throughout this country who have no teeth in their mouth, they can't afford hearing aids, they can't afford eyeglasses. People want to expand Medicare. They want to expand childcare. In this state, I think as we all know, the average cost of childcare is $15,000. So if you're making $40,000, $50,000, how do you afford childcare? That's for one kid, two, it's almost impossible. We want to create a situation where no family in America is paying more than 7% of their limited income. Make universal, make pre-K universal and free. Deal with climate changes, as Congressman Welch indicated. So this is a very, very popular piece of legislation. Sadly, we have zero Republican support. And at this particular moment, we have two members of the Democratic caucus, and we need all 50 who have not yet come on board. But to answer your question, I believe given the enormous support that this legislation has from the American people, from the President of the United States, from some 96% of the Democratic caucus in both the House and the Senate, yeah, we are going to pass this, and this will be the most consequential piece of legislation for working families, for the environment uh, that we have seen in the modern history of this country. So, Senator Manchin, and you've heard him say it many times, I, if I can't settle this in West Virginia, I can't vote for it. Do you think maybe he needs to broaden his horizon a little bit? Well, it's it funny that you mention that, Bob. <laughs> I just heard about poll after poll in West Virginia which shows that all of these provisions, not surprisingly, West Virginia is a poor state. They are enormously popular. So uh, trust me, uh, we are working on this bill like 24-7. Uh, 
uh, and we are going to get it done, and we're going to have Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema uh, on board as well. On the Senator Sanders, have you spoken to either Senator Manchin or Senator Sinema uh, since your last press conference where you briefly addressed this? There's, you know, it is uh, an issue of such consequence. The President of the United States is working very hard on this. Uh, the majority leader in the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, is working hard on that. Nancy Pelosi in the House is working hard on it. Everybody is working hard on it. The Political problem you have is in the Senate, we got 50 votes, that's it, all right? So every single person has got to be on board. Peter Welch has the luxury of having a three-vote majority in a 435-member body. They got a problem as well. So this is not easy. This is not easy. But there's, everybody knows the enormity of the stakes involved, uh, and we are going to pass it. In your press conference, sorry to hammer on this, but in your press conference last week, you asked for more specifics from Senators Manchin and Sinema about why they are opposed. Have you received word on those specifics? We are making progress in that area. I think you may have seen that the White House today made a, a correct point, and I know Senator Schumer feels the same way. I suspect Speaker Pelosi does, is this thing has dragged on month after month, uh, and uh, we've got to get this done. So there's a sense of urgency now, and I suspect you'll see some action uh, in the near-term future. Senator Leahy, uh, Majority Leader Schumer said yesterday or today that he's going to hold a vote next week on, the, on your voting rights bill, the John Lewis voting rights bill. Uh, it may not get any Republican support. Is this a bill that it's worth uh, dumping the filibuster rule in order to pass it? Well, there are a number of things that might uh, change the filibuster rule. Certainly, uh, lifting the debt limit would be one of those. But the fact is, people ought to vote for what is right. I get so tired of somebody said, "Well, you know, this might hurt me politically." In my first three months, I was in the Senate. At that time. The majority view in Vermont was in favor of the Vietnam War. No member of uh, our congressional delegation had ever opposed it or voted against it. We had a pivotal vote coming up, and we had a large, new, large at that time, newspaper which actually had influence. They told me I'd never be reelected if I voted against it. The money for the Vietnam War was cut off by a one vote margin, mine as the newest member of the committee. I never had any question in my mind. It was the right thing to do. And I tell some senators in both parties, look at what is the right thing to do. What's the right thing to do? Senator Sanders absolutely correctly talks about the popularity. The polls that he's talking about, that has a virtually equal number of Republicans and Democrats who support these issues. So let's vote on them. Let's do what's right for the American people. And certainly in the Senate, with six-year terms, people ought to be willing to do that. Nobody owns a seat there or in the House. But you do owe responsibility to your state, not to the media uh, public opinion polls, but to what is best for your state. And I'd urge House members and Senate members in both parties to vote for those things that are best for their states because uh, Bernie and Peter are absolutely correct. These are issues that the vast majority of Americans across the political spectrum throughout the country support. Then why the hell don't we get down there and vote for them? Thank you. Sorry for the language, Governor. We've never heard that language before in this building. So is that a, I wasn't quite sure about your answer. Was that a yes that the voting rights bill was so important that if you have to dump the filibuster, that's what happens? If, if it was necessary on that one bill, uh, yes, but we're not going to do this on a piecemeal basis. You know, I, I voted more on filibuster reform than any member of the U.S. Senate. And I voted to change the filibuster rule on different occasions. Certainly we should do it on debt limit. But the John Lewis a bill basically is passed 
almost unanimously, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the past, who can be against voting reform that ensures everybody gets a chance to vote? Look what we do here in Vermont. In fact, I got, I won't say which junior senator from Texas said this, but uh, uh, Senator Cruz was complaining in Judiciary Committee that we want to change this to elect Democrats. I said, look at Vermont. Vermont has the most open voting possible. Uh, you can vote right at the last minute. You don't need an excuse to, uh, for uh, mail-in ballots. And you say this is just for Democrats. We elect a Republican governor and a Democratic lieutenant governor. He did not have a response. I said, incidentally, they're both very, very good. Okay, um, I think that does it. Thank you very much for coming in.